Um, I, I'm, my name is Isaac Cates. I'm the moderator for this panel on um, world building and character in kids' comics. And I will, in just a second, introduce our panelists and ask some questions. Um, my approach to this is to try to make it feel like a conversation among us for a while. And then after a bit, if you guys have got questions, I'll, I'll take a few for, from you and we can talk about them. Um, when you get ready to pose a question, because we're in this auditorium and everything's being uh, recorded, there are mics in the aisles on either side. And when you get ready to ask, just like approach, I'll, you know, I'll let you know when it's time, but we need to get you on mic so that you're in the, in the recording. We would be able to hear you just fine from where you're sitting, but the other people who watch this later wouldn't have any idea what you said. Um, so let me just introduce everybody super briefly. Um, first, my name, like I said, is Isaac Cates. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an academic and I teach stuff about the graphic novel, but I also am the editor of a series called Cartesia Tales. It's a kids, uh, ad, well, kid-friendly adventure comic. Um, and I've got it upstairs if you want to come take a look at it. But it, it turns out that I think a lot about world building and about character. Um, and so I may also have stuff to say as well as questions to ask. But I, I just wanted to let you know like where I'm at in this. Um, then I'll just go from your right to your left. Uh, ben Sears is uh, uh, um, most recently the author of Volcano Trash. It's a series of, I guess, sort of sci-fi-ish uh, comics with a, uh, a kind of kid, kid vigilante protagonist, yeah. kid superhero, and a robot sidekick named Hank uh, take place in a sort of uh, futuristic, slightly authoritarian, dystopian sort of world called Bolt City that uh, is pretty fun and cool. Um, next to him is Laura Terry, who has a self-published little thing called Adorable Empire, uh, but also has a new book from Scholastic called Graveyard Shakes that is about a uh, sort of little village of ghosts interacting with an all-girls boarding school. Um, next to her is Janet Lee, who is the cartoonist on Return of the Dapper Men, which has a really gorgeous um, collected, uh, collected republication from Top Shelf right now. And um, they're really kind of charming and interesting and almost sort of I don't know, what's the word for like a book that feels like it could come from any time, any moment in time? Like it, it uh, that, was you know, our, that was our goal. Thank yeah, you. It, it feels it feels like it was made by yeah, time yeah. or like a Chronos is what I'm thinking. Like it's not it's not just that it's timeless, but like it feels. It, I'm sorry. It feels like it might have been made by some outsider artist in the '60s, or the '70s, or this month. <laughs> like it, it, it's really hard to locate, it, and it's interesting. We'll talk more. And then at the far end of the table is Lucy Bellwood, who has a self-published book called Baggy Wrinkles, and also some really cool sketchbooky stuff, and is one of my uh, colleagues or collaborators or, I don't know, my team on Cartesia Tales as well. So she's been doing some cool world building with me for kids. Okay. So one of the things about the way that the uh, sort of uh, thinking about this panel um, one of the things it seems to assume is this idea that there's somehow a trade-off between world building and character development. Um, like that's kind of in the write-up of the, of the panel itself. And, and, it, and it might not be initially obvious to you why there would be some tension between those two things. Um, but the fact is that it's just a question of real estate on the page. Like you can only spend time doing one thing at a time, sort of. I mean, you can world build and develop characters sort of simultaneously, but the more time you spend telling the reader things about the way that the world works, the less time you're going to get to have for your characters to do things in that world and to make choices in that world and to interact. And so there is a sort of a trade-off. And, you know, you can, you can imagine the way that um, your sort of stereotypical ponderous fantasy novel might start with a couple of chapters of history before you even meet any characters. I don't think any of us feel like we can afford to do that. On the other hand, if you plunge people into a completely created world with no um, uh, space for exposition, with no place for the characters to discover things, and they all just kind of know what everything is, it's very easy to lose people. I mean, to just kind of get them lost in the labyrinth of your preconceived world. And so one of the things I want to I ask about or get us thinking about is like how we navigate that trade-off, if you think of it as a trade-off. 
Like, is there a way or a strategy that you might use in building your comics or thinking about how the plot is going to unfold, where you're, you're deliberately at some moment thinking, oh, well, this will help my reader learn more of the world or see more of the world um, before I dump all of my exposition on them? Or are there things that you, you figure out that you need to have as like world logic that you decide you don't ever really need to put in a comic because uh, it'll be implied or it won't be important or although you needed to know it, maybe the reader and the characters are never really going to see it. Um, do you want to talk about that for a little bit? And maybe I could pose another question as, as it becomes important. Sure. I think treating your backgrounds like a character um, with like just as much thought and preparation um, could help you skip a lot of like the expository dialogue. So like... I don't know, just having, like, instead of just drawing, like, a generic car, like, draw, like, something hanging from the rearview mirror, or, like, I don't know, a bumper sticker. Yeah, there's a, there's a fruit stand in Volcano Trash where the fruit that's being sold is, like, not earth fruit. Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't look like anything I could buy. Yeah, I mean, like, if you, I think skimping on the background in a comic that requires a lot of, like, world building is it's kind of shooting yourself in the foot so like i don't know i think it needs if you develop your backgrounds and like settings as much as you develop your characters then it kind of like saves time and space I think. and you've got to situate them in place right if right, someone yeah. is in front of something then they're contextually given more dimension as a character by what's surrounding them and it doesn't, I, I think the reason that what Isaac's driving at, the tension that exists between world building and character development is that a lot of younger cartoonists start out crafting these magnum opus six volume space operatic dramas that are going to take a million years to complete and it's just never going to get done because they devote all their time to figuring out the systems of how, like how gravity works on outlying moons and the further reaches of the system of this galaxy and that is great to know but it can take over your life and prevent you from focusing on telling a story and if the goal is to tell a story and I think that's an excellent point to treat your character like or to treat your backgrounds like a character, that character is part of your story. And everything that you reveal about the background of the world has to drive the narrative forward. And if it doesn't, then you're just kind of like set dressing for no reason. I think you also sort of need a touchstone. So the more fantastic the background or the, the setting for the story is, you need something very human about the mm -hmm. character or very yeah. human about Good the point. setting so that you can get your head around it a little bit. And I mean, it doesn't technically have to be, but if, if you can give your audience a bit of a, um, a touchstone within the world mm -hmm. um, that they can relate to, then it makes a lot of other things sort of fall into place. Yeah. You mean like something well, familiar, right? right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, thinking about this, this the the fruit stand, I mean, you've got like a, a huge market in, in one of your panels that I've, sorry, I stopped you online a little bit last night. And, um, it, but it, it was, it's clearly alien and there's alien creatures in it, but it's also clearly a market and you know how that functions within the world. You, you know what you're going to do at that place if you were a human showing up there. So it, it's both very alien and very familiar at the same time. Or if you see like someone buying something, are they buying? Are they bartering? Are they trading? Exactly. What does the currency look like? And none of that is necessary. You need to know. All you need to story. know. And, and that's something that the audience can fill in a little bit. And yeah. It doesn't impact the story, but it impacts their enjoyment of the story mm -hmm. maybe. Or l allowing them to figure it out yeah. can, can allow them to personalize. Well, and that also engages the, people. The, the details that are important are the ones that like make you connect emotionally with with that character or with that place. So it's all about like picking the right details that are like mm -hmm. specific mm -hmm. enough that make that character and that place feel real right. and kind of letting that other stuff just fall to the wayside. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. otherwise you curation. get so overwhelmed with information. It's a bit of curation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And there's also a reason that so many fantasy stories involve non native people, you know, or like non uh, magical people stumbling into magical worlds, because then you've got an everyman character who right. can walk around. And this is dangerous because you don't just want a, a protagonist who keeps walking around going, what does this do? What is this? How does this work? And everyone just spends the entire book explaining to them how things function. Right. Um, but it can also be a helpful end to have somebody who, like the reader, 
is being thrust into an environment that is unfamiliar. I mean, that's what I, my, my book is about. It's not a biographical, but it's about the time I spent sailing on 18th century tall ships, which are not an environment that many modern people interact with. Um, and it was an easy framing narrative because I was learning my way around that environment. And so lots of people were teaching me things. But that is a more interesting narrative than an instructional manual on how to sail a tall ship. Nobody well, really cares. For that matter, more interesting and maybe more accessible than just having sailors doing what they do without yes. talking to each other about it. Because it, you know, one of the one of the like world building errors that you might see someone do is having characters who are familiar with their world right. talking about it explicitly as if they're introducing it to somebody because the reader needs the information. Yeah, and it's it's nice better. to have a character who kind of doesn't know. Uh, doesn't know what's going on. Even in, in Lars' um, uh, graveyard shakes, there's uh, you know there's humans interacting with ghosts for the first time, and like having the little ghost say, "Oh, ghosts can't hurt people; they can only hurt other ghosts." And like that's going to pay off later in the story, but it's important for for us to know that early on, and also the character needs to know that at that point because she doesn't know it yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and that's like that's for like for the audience, like letting them know these are the rules of the world. So these are the kinds of things that can happen and can't happen. So the ghosts are never going to be able to, like, you know, stab someone to death. Important in a, Important. In a kid's title. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a totally random tangent, and I'll keep it short. But like, I think sometimes when I'm thinking about world building, about the first, I mean, the, the first produced Star Wars movie, and how in that Luke doesn't know like how the Force works, right. and and how what Jedi's are, and all that stuff, and it gets explained to him, so we learn it, and in all the other ones. It's just assumed, like everything that you see in the prequels, everybody in the movie knows everything about what's going on already. And so there's no, even though there's a ton of world, mm. there's not like, there's not an entry point for the world. And so it doesn't feel like world building. It feels like this weird sort of tourism where, you know, like, okay, you have a really awesome set. <laughs> it's like being a non-comics person at an SPX dinner. <laughs> I don't know what any of you are talking about. <laughs> it's very exclusionary. But, you know, having the, having the um, I mean, even if it's not a point of view character, but a character who has to have things explained mm -hmm. gives you a legitimate reason to um, mm -hmm. unpack a little bit of, of what you know about the world. Yeah, and that point about information paying off down the line in the story is really valuable because, like, you need to know the rules of the world, right. but only insofar, again, as they relate to the storyline. Right, right. Like, if ghosts can't hurt people, but there's actually no violent conflict in the story, is that relevant? Right. Do you need, maybe you need to know that they can't eat food. Like, I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, well, one thing also that I've been thinking about, and I guess this is sort of beginning to be what I was saying a second ago, is the question of how much work you do in advance. Like um, Lucy's Im imaginary uh, first-time cartoonist who, no, I've met these people also, they, they take my classes, um, who, who has worked out all the rules of the world and knows uh, the backstory of all these characters, but doesn't actually have a, a plot for the characters to engage in. And it's like they've spent all their time rolling up their character sheets and reading the module, but they don't they don't actually have a story yet. Um, how much of that sort of prep work do you guys do um, before you set off to do a new story? Or how much of it is like only baked into the process of figuring out the story you want to tell? I am 100% the wrong person to ask this question because I spend way too much time world building at the beginning because it's, like, it's so much fun for me. Um, so there's like there's like a rabbit hole that I can fall into where I just like I want to know like there's there's like a lair in the underworld and there are bookshelves and what's on the bookshelves like are there scrolls with magic spells and um, and like tusks from woolly mammoths like what's going on um, so for me it's like trying to be reasonable and responsible and say like okay that's enough time to think about the story, you probably don't need to know what's on that magic scroll rolled up on that bookshelf in the underground lair. What are the limiting factors for that? Like, what is the point at which you have to say, like, enough, no more? It's probably, like, when it, when it stops being useful to the story that I'm working on right now. Like, it, I find that what it's better for me to do is, like, try and not do the world building until I'm at a point where it's inconvenient for me not to have figured something out, to not know what a character's relationship was like with his mother when he was growing up. Do you ever think about saving that information and using it for a story down the line or including oh, it in something else? I save, I save everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ben, what about you? Do you, do you how much do you do in advance? I mean, you, you've got other uh, um, Bolt City stuff that comes before Volcano Trash, so. Um, I think I do a lot of like prop and environment design. So like, if it's an object that's being used in the story, like. If I have to figure it out on the page, like sometimes that's necessary, but it's nice to like know what it looks like and how it functions before I get there. It's so, like I'll do like sketchbook pages of like a character's shoes or like a little radio that they use or like a jacket that they wear because it's raining in this scene. Um, so basically just like building up the essential stuff so I don't have to worry about it when I'm actually drawing the page. Mm. And that's a lot of decision making. Yeah. Yeah. As you go, it's like, how do you outfit people? What are they wearing? What's practical? Yeah. Well, it also brings in like um, familiarity, like because everything I do is like kind of futuristic science fictiony, but it's all based on like things I encounter in life. Mm. Like, uh, like if I draw a kitchen, there's going to be like a cutting board, a <laughs> stove with like some burners, and a microwave above the stove, and like I don't know, just. Kind of little minute details, but I feel like they draw you in a little better if it's just there. Yeah, it's like a familiar framework that, yeah. that strange yeah. things are populating. Yeah. 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 How, how often in those sketchbook pages are you drawing from life, if at all? Do you feel like you're kind of past that now and you're mostly just working from imagination? Uh, yeah, working from like the idea of something yeah. as opposed to like observational because, mm -hmm. I don't know, that's, that's more fun. Mm -hmm. like, cause you can get bogged down and like, get disappointed because your radio doesn't look like an actual radio. <laughs> yeah, totally. I struggle with that a lot because the work that I do is grounded in like a very, very specific and historically accurate environment and you can't draw all of the lines on a tall ship. Yeah. Like, if you do it, it becomes visually insensible. <laughs> it just makes no... Yeah, so it's like knowing what you can take out and what you can leave and what you can fudge and people will still understand what you're trying to convey. And in this case, because it's educational, I really struggle with that to try and get away from using too much reference and thinking like, oh, it's gotta be exactly right because otherwise people are gonna yell at me because it's not perfect. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't help that there are like French cartoonists who do naval comics that are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even wanna talk about it. Although sometimes you do, I mean, I've done several period dramas where the costuming has to be absolutely correct and they will they're every bit as crazy as oh, yeah, totally. Spider-Man fans. That mm -hmm. It's the costumes on, <laughs> like, like, where the webs yeah, going, how tall are yeah, the wigs, not, like, yeah. frowny faces instead of smiley faces. It's crazy. And and you have, I mean, certain periods like Regency period, if you're off by 10 years, the costumes are changed completely and they will nail you for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all for kids, so it's a huge pain in the right. <laughs> yeah, working, working in an existing world is really different, I guess, from, uh, well, it's sort of different from making one up. I mean, you have to, yeah. you have to do the research one way or the other, but in one case, the research is right. invention, and in the other case, the research is like actual getting online or getting into a library kind of research. I know I've talked to uh, Jason Lutz a few times about Berlin and how he, he has, he's got like, uh, tram cars running on the correct street, like the right design of the tram car on the correct street corner for the characters to be getting on a tram in that place. It's crazy, but he kind of has to do that because some of the people who are reading his book, like there are a handful of people who are reading it who remember Berlin in a yeah. period that he can never visit. So, you know. Or if you've ever watched a television show that's shot in your hometown, like my partner's from Belfast, and we were talking about the show The Fall, which is filmed there, but features the protagonist like taking a cab to get to a location that's two blocks away from the place that she just left, yeah. and they're conveying it like, oh, this is the other side of the city. And he's like, no, it's not. It's not how it works. Which is the thing how like world building can totally make or break yes. an environment if your audience is familiar with it from another context. Yeah, I, really had, I had an experience yeah. like that watching the movie Slacker while I lived in Austin. And, oh, yeah. Uh, there's, there's similar stuff. Um, I mean, there's also movies that are you know clearly not shot in the place where they're supposed to be, like Rumble in the Bronx, which is it looks an awful lot like Vancouver. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I wanted to say about world building and like extra stuff that um, when we were working on Cartesian Tales, the, the pre prep had to be a little different because it was a world that we were sharing instead of one that we could like, in, well we were also going to be individually inventing the pieces, but we spent I think like two months. Uh, and this is sharing amongst like nine cartoonists. Yeah, there's, a, there's a bunch of us all really working together on and telling format. stories in different parts of the map at the same time, but before we started telling any stories at all, I collected up some place names so that we would have a sense of what things sort of sounded like in Cartesia and also some uh, um, 
we did a bunch of creature designs. Mm -hmm. not, not even all of them have even made it into the comic, but one of the cool things about it is that now, because they're kind of shared creature designs, like there's some critters that have shown up in the background of like one of my stories and one of Lucy's stories and one of Sarah Beacon's stories, and they're just like, they're, they're just things that live in Cartesia, and nobody talks much about them, but like there yeah. they are, those little weird things. And, um, and we have those things in common too, so mm -hmm. like at one point, Jen Vaughn needed a sea serpent, and I had already drawn a sea serpent, so she just used the one that I had, and that, that's kind of cool, you know. Like we, we but uh, we had to have, we had to work out like a, a bible for that kind of stuff, and we shared a lot of character designs and stuff too before, before we got started. And even as it is, I mean, the the kind of world building that we did for that store, that book, um, would totally not work for something in a more realism bound world like because there's so many different kinds of people and kinds of creatures and cultures like jammed up next to each other we accept that in a fantasy world but if it were if it were i don't know i guess if it was a sci-fi world it would have to be a spaceport because there's so many different people mixing with each other yeah um another thing that we did before um before we properly got started was just like uh, talked about um people whose work in that vein or, or like stories in that vein that we liked so we would have a sense of like what flavor we were all kind of gravitating toward you know so yeah so like you know certain series of fantasy novels or certain um certain Miyazaki movies or certain you know like touchstones that would that would be things that we would think of as being close to what we were working on um and i wonder and this is not exactly the other question that i want to ask but i wonder also, whether there are people or cartoonists or movie makers or whatever that you think of as doing really good uh, world building work that you think of as like models for models for how you're going to do this when you get ready to tell a story, like who, who you look to for, um, I guess, inspiration or more like a, a kind of modeling of good behavior. Uh, best practices. Along these lines. Yeah, best practices. That's a good way to put it. Hmm. Um. I think the Ardman animations, they do like Wallace and Gromit. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. is like a really good example of just like a densely populated world um, that you don't really, like there's not much like outside story going on. It's about like the dog and the guy or like something like that. But the backgrounds are just so rich with like information that you could pause it and like look and there's a framed picture on the wall of like them on the moon or something <laughs> or like a little alarm clock and it's just so like nicely designed yeah so, like, yeah i think stop motion in particular Leica films are like that too you know like stop motion lends itself to that kind of obsessive detail or everything stuff. has to be made anyway so like, it's got to be intentional like you can't just literal like, literal like, building clock. going on <laughs> yeah, you, know? yeah true. You, can't, you can't shop for any of that stuff it all has to be manufactured by people for that's a really film. good point yeah it's not set dressers it's set yeah. makers the whole way yeah. through and and so especially with art or like a, an individual like a film there's mm -hmm. a lot of like individual um aesthetic stylization too yeah. that kind of counts as world building for those like a lot of the stuff that you see in a Wallace and Gromit movie uh, or short is like the equivalent of stuff that's in the real world yeah. but it feels like Ardman stuff because it's been passed through that aesthetic filter yeah. that's an interesting thing to think about mm -hmm. and then and then you know you're also willing to accept that there's like an evil robot dog <laughs> or, or like right. robotic trousers or whatever that like ex exist in that world and couldn't exist in ours but it's like part of the way that their world works yeah it's funny you mentioned pausing and looking for stuff in the background too Ben because like I the books that immediately sprung to mind for me were um, Puzzle Island which is a, a kids book that's like yeah. coding and searching for hidden figures in the backgrounds of an illustrated story and Graham Bass's uh, The Eleventh Hour which is another like lushly illustrated kids book that involves a lot of hunting for tiny hidden things in the illustrations and I loved stuff like that that didn't bash me over the head with world building but laid out a world and then invited me to look closer and like codes and hidden stuff I was really into that kind of thing um, and I haven't really done much of that in my comics work but when you said that that was immediately what I thought of was like I enjoy watching uh, like the the pirates um, that film that Ardman did which is an adaptation of a Gideon Defoe book 
Um, also had tons of like background wanted posters that were little jokes or you know asides, and that to me makes a world feel really rich. Is like oh, there's humor in here, and there are Easter eggs. Like, yeah, we, we did it. We deliberately did a thing like that in Cartesia Tales, where there's like a species of of like uh, well, I don't know if you did it, but I, 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 I put stuff in. There's a there's a species of of like uh, hobo fairies. They're like they don't have houses; they just won't wander. Some people call them ho hobo goblins, right? But they, they don't like that. But they they communicate with each other by means of like stamping um, oh, that's right. yeah, signs yeah. on to places with a, a cup with a bowl and an axe. And so there's like a whole bunch of different glyphs that you can make with a circle and a line that mean things to them. Mm -hmm. And we deliberately, me and a few other people anyway, we're deliberately hiding those in the comic for like four or five issues before we put a chart in that explained what they mean. Yeah. So you could go back to earlier issues and be like, oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> or like um, Drew Weing uh, did this beautifully in the Creepy Case Files of Barno Baloo, which you should definitely buy. He has it here at SPX. It's great. Um, where there was a storyline about a mother who had lost, a mother goblin who had lost, or an ogre troll, something who had lost her baby. And at the end of the storyline, he was like, cool, there's 89 instances of this mother goblin in this storyline. If you can find all of them, I'll send you a book for free. And everyone like, I was like, oh my god, where are they all? And they were just hidden in the backgrounds of the panels. And it was totally, like, you wouldn't have noticed if you were just reading the comic for fun. But I loved that. It was it was such a good example of, like, I, I looked at those pages real hard. And I'm one of those terrible people who just reads word balloons like I'm really bad at taking my time which is dumb because I'm a cartoonist I know how long it takes but <laughs> uh, yeah I don't know what about you Jen? I well I mean maybe it's because I'm currently working on <laughs> surrealist fiction in a lot of ways I, I I've right now when, when the first thing that came to mind for me was something like a Winsor McKay like a mm. like a little Nemo yeah, sort of situation yeah. where it's where you're going to something so insane but you have to start with something really normal and kind of end with something normal but in between you can be jumping on giant mushrooms or fall off stilts that turn into birds I mean crazy stuff and yet you you end up in a comfortable place you yeah you always have new at the end. end yeah but I also kind of like ones that um the other thing that came to mind was something like a like a pan's labyrinth where it's it's so normal. It may be dreadful and terrible, but it's it's an it's a known world. It's understandable. And things go off the rails. Then things are just suddenly everything is up for grabs, and you don't know what's right. But but you understand this kid, and you may not understand what's happening to her. But you and that and and that in a way for me is really special because is she going insane, mm -hmm. or is she actually experiencing stuff like this? So I, I like the ambiguity too sometimes. So. I don't know if that's helpful, but those, those are two like examples yeah, of the way yeah, things yeah. are framed that I I get a lot of inspiration from. A little darker than what I'm working on, but you know. <laughs> are you working uh, with a writer on this project? I am. I am it, probably Pan's Labyrinth this game, but my my I did not study art. My degree is in English, so and and my minor was in creative writing. So I feel like at some point I should probably try writing something too, instead of just drawing. But um, Dapper Men in particular was a weird situation because the the story was written around artwork I had done. So it's, oh, it's this weird sort of thing. Because I was going to ask, like, based happened. on, since the rest of us are doing writing and yeah. illustrating, yeah. what that experience was like, whether, because one of the things I like about mm -hmm. Cartosia is that working, collaborating with other people can be a really good way to inspire it's wonderful, playfulness. Right? Yes. Like, I, Cartosia is the only chance I've ever had, really, to do that kind of just no holds barred, like, I don't know, make something up, world right. building. And right. I was wondering what working with your writer was like. I, 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 love, I mean, I usually tell people that if we do, if we all do our jobs right, the sum of the total yeah. is better than what yes. we would have come up with on our own. So totally. if we're all collaborating well and bouncing ideas off of each other, then, you know, the script will say one thing and you can call up and say, you know, hey, what if we throw a giant snow beast into that panel? What would that do to it? You know, I, I feel like he's actually going into a Yeti's cave. Or something like that. He, <laughs> it is very yeti. It feels to me. yeti to me. And, um, and you can sort of craft little moments within the story that you, you maybe, you know, that, that, that maybe the writer didn't ever think of, but it, it spurs more into the story or it ties it in. I, I like to be really involved yeah. with it. Did yeah. the writer find your artwork and then say... We were friends. Okay. We were, we were friends, and then he, um, he took off to go work for Marvel in New York and decided he wanted to write his own stuff, but he was coming home and, um, regularly, and I was working in book publishing, so I was not doing this. I was doing, like, total, like, numbers, math stuff, and uh, started doing artwork on the side for fun, and we just 
he, he just got inspired by some artwork that I was doing for fun and uh, that's how it happened yeah. so, but now I do this full time so it's I thought more about it than I, yeah. did I, I think <laughs> I think so much I mean c partly because what we do in Cartesi Tales is really intensely collaborative but I think so much about what Janet was saying about how when you collaborate with somebody the the sort of sum of what you do is greater than what you could, what either of you could individually have done, right? That like mm. somehow you cover for each other and there's a moment where whoever's drawing has a better idea than what's in the script and the good script writer would be like, yeah, that's a better idea. Right, and on the flip side, and, the, the, right, the illustrator is willing to listen and go back and go, yeah, no, you need to pull back from right, right. they know what they're going. Right, right. Well, yeah, exactly. That, that um, basically at each point you want to, I, I, we actually, I brought a zine uh, this year to SPX that's new that um, is about how we collaborate. And you can come find me at my table and I'll, I'll sell it to you um, or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> or talk to you about it if you don't want to buy it. But, um, but one of the things uh, in it is uh, um, the idea that, you know, like if you work with people you trust, then you also have to trust the people you work with. And like you give things up to them uh, and say, yeah, no, actually I'm pretty sure you know better than me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's hard to do if you're used to working by yourself, but there's a corollary to that if you're working alone, mm -hmm. which is that, because we don't ever, we don't ever, like, make comics completely and totally spontaneously. There's always, like, some amount of planning before you're actually inking. Yes. And we also share whatever. with an audience, and that's yeah. a collaboration, yeah. right? Like, but what happens I, in the gutters, like, that's up to the audience. I, I want to I think, like, like even at the moment of like, okay, so I'm composing the panel and I've got a script, but then the penciler in my head f realizes that the script writer in my head had it wrong. And like, I have to trust the, the new version of me, you know, or like the inker yeah. version of me realizes, no, wait, hold on, this isn't composed the way that it should be. Let me go back and fix it. So all of those little moments of like revision, I kind of think of them as like interior collaboration. Maybe it makes me feel better about what I'm doing when I think of it that way. <laughs> but like, you know, all of the, oh, I need a detail here. What can I put in? You know, when I work with somebody, I'm, I'm like, I outsource some of that to them. But when I'm working by myself, it's like, you know, populating a room of different faculties or abilities inside my head. and. Yeah. each of them individually so you know, there's an element of that just in the nature of comics you have to simulate so many other people's roles mm -hmm. or so many so many roles that would be had by other people if you were say making a film yeah you when, when you're collaborating with somebody else like that it, does it ever become painful to like g give up ideas to them to let go of things that you really cared about that they're saying I, they're not working you know I um, I fight that so hard like, I, I just want, like, and I think, at, like, if, I, if somebody were trying to do that to me about my teaching, I would fight. You know, my teaching is the way that it is, and it's going to be the way it is. <laughs> but, but when I'm doing creative stuff, I try to, I mean, I don't know, this sounds dorky, I guess, but, like, I try to have as little ego about it as I can, because mm -hmm. I want the product to be better. I want the product to be better than I can make it. I, so, I kind of like that improv rule. It's like yes and. Yes, yes. yes. So maybe yes. if they're going in the direction you're not comfortable like with, improv. you can say yes, but uh, let's go yeah. that way. But like every time I finish something, I want it to be better than it mm -hmm. than it was. Yeah. So like if I can get some input and somebody can say, well, you know, what if you put a thing here, or what if you? <laughs> yeah. I've had situations where my 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 knee-jerk reaction was, you know, no, no, I don't like that idea. That's not good. And I usually sit there with it for 24 hours or so and go. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Well, I, guess I guess you're right. And and a lot of times it's actually it, yeah. most of the time if they if someone feels that passionately about it where they're they're willing to go to, you pick your fights, you know, there's some things you're willing to go to the mat for, you know, that won't work. We can't do it that way. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that you're um that you're not. And and if you if you sit with it a little bit and you're like, if they're if they're that passionate about it, let's try it that way. And I have found that Probably 80 to 90% of the time, they were right. You know, there, there's, a, there's a way in which this all kind of unfolds interestingly back into the question of world building, though, mm -hmm. because a lot of the time when we're telling a story that's in a place that we've made up, mm -hmm. we know more about that place than is in the story so far. Yes. 
And somebody might say, oh, well, you should have the character do X, Y, Z. And you're like, but nobody can do that in this <laughs> world. Like, that's not something that happens in this world. And, and you, you have this sort of interior, or even just like, you know, no, that's not in that place. I can't, I can't have them, uh, you know, get on a spaceship at this place because there's not a port. Right. You know, or there's no energy supplies. Or what, like, I've worked it out in my head so that, that no, that solution's impossible. And it always makes it a lot easier to turn down those kinds of suggestions because like, that does happen a lot when people are like, oh, oh, you should. Um, and that works for you know, like story suggestions or for people saying like, oh, you should work for not very much money. And you're like, I'm so sorry, I just can't pay my bills. <laughs> <laughs> I like to do that sometimes where like, having a multi-group collaboration helps yeah. because cause the person that's reading the script can go, I didn't really get this part. And you're like, oh my gosh, I totally should have mentioned yeah. somewhere that there's no spaceport in right. that area. Yeah, you know, yeah, or, yeah. or somehow work it into yeah, it yeah, where yeah, yeah. it's now suddenly clear and it's like a second set of eyes looking at the, stuff. The end result may not be that you do what they no, suggest, but, but just that you, just it, you realize that there's a way to clarify what you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's well, just a clarity issue. And yeah. I'm, I, don't, I don't collaborate much at all, but I am a huge believer in having editors. And I have like yes. a cartooning buddy I meet every week and we're yeah. like, like, looking at each other's pages. Yes. And like, I trust them, and they give me suggestions sometimes, and I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. But usually, they're almost always wrong about something that's not working. Mm -hmm. And maybe the solution is something that like, is, is like way in the pages that I've done before. Mm. So it's, it's always about like, issue. yeah, it's like, just it's just figuring out the, the trusting kinks your and audience. stuff, and, yeah. and they're almost like a first audience. It's, they're going to catch the stuff that would confuse someone else. Yeah, they yeah. can figure it out from there. I was curious to ask you, though, since you are a writer, author, or a writer, artist, um, but you are working with an editor. Um, and who are you working with at Graphics? Um, I'm working with Cassandra Pell. Okay, who cool. Is, uh, yeah, amazing. She's lovely. Um, but I was curious what that process has been like for you, like how involved she was, not just in the um, writing, crafting, but in the artwork. Like, you have a cartooning buddy, but is she involved in the whole package? Like, how how has that process been for you in terms of building the world of your story? Did you bring all the world building material to her? Yeah. Um, well, I, I I had it all pretty well developed because I was like, this is going to take a couple of years of my life. It might even take a couple of years off of my life. <laughs> so, like, I want to... <laughs> Um, so I was like, I need to know that I can I can make this and I can I can love it, um, even though it stresses me out so much that I can love it from the beginning to the end and I believe in it. And so I ha I developed it uh, quite quite a lot um, before Cassandra came in. Yeah. But we have a relationship of like of like of really trusting each other, and um, and so I kn I know at any point if she comes to me and sa and says like this this. Plot element isn't going in the right way. Like I'll go, okay, let's fix it. Even though I'm really attached to it. <laughs> ben, what's your experience been like with editorial input and stuff like that? I, I, I mean, are you pretty much just doing what you want to do with those Vault City stories, or? Pretty much. Um, there's a lot of like copy editing, like grammar stuff. Yeah. yeah. But, um, I tend to be kind of meticulous about like narrative structure, so I'll have like the main points written down on like post-it notes or index cards and arrange it how I want it, step back for like a day or two um, just to get some distance from it and then look at it again and you can kind of see like, you know, glaring continuity error. <laughs> I don't know, just things that like a second set of eyes would see. So I don't really work with editors. I just make sure I edit myself. Yeah. Pretty heavily. A lot of the time you can get a lot of that work done with like whatever's already, what you're already able to do if you can get enough distance from it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the real key word. And like, it's funny that you say, you know, yeah, and I'm, I step back for it for a day. <laughs> you know, whereas some people are like, I don't know, Stephen King talks about like he finishes a book and puts the manuscript in a drawer for like a month or two before he looks at it again. Yeah. And there's, I mean, if you have the luxury of that time, that's nice. Uh, but if you're cramming to get something out for a convention, you're like, oh, shoot, sure, I gotta go. Um, but, but that kind of distance is whatever form it takes is generally, like, you know, or you're working on the solutions to those problems while you're sleeping or when you're in the shower and suddenly you're like, oh, I forgot about thing X. I can yeah. fix that. It's, I mean, yeah, just, I mean, if you ever have, like, actual life problems, like going for a walk and just kind of decompressing mm -hmm. can help you see it from different angles, and that works for, like, world building and story stuff, too. You just mm -hmm. kind of not, not actively working on it, but still thinking about it can 
solve a whole lot of problems. Yeah, like being out of the world for a while, <laughs> coming back to it, as if you're one of these point of view characters who has to relearn a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think about this doing the crossword a lot. Like my housemate and I are real into the New York Times crossword, and the Sunday ones take a long time, and it's generally a team effort. And so often we'll be bashing our heads against it for a whole afternoon, and then if I go to sleep and wake up the next morning over breakfast, I'm just like banging out clues because it all makes sense after falling asleep. Uh, so just take a nap. is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> sleep or, or a shower. Right? Or, a shower. or a shower. Yeah, or showers, or naps, or walks. Something. Yeah. Or get, read a book. Get a dog. Get a dog. Get a dog. Get a cat. Or, uh, you know, a baby. Uh, Another thing that works for me, actually, is just getting immersed in other people's stories for a little while and forgetting about the problems of mine. Like, I will, I will get inspired off of seeing somebody else solve a narrative problem, mm. even though they solved it a long time ago. You know, I'm not, like, watching them solve it, but it, because I'm watching the story play out. Mm -hmm. There's a question. Like, do you have to quarantine yourself? Because for, for me, at certain stages of the process, if I'm reading other people's stuff, I get too caught up in it, and then it starts influencing my own work. Like, I'm curious if y'all, you know, you have influences, you have inspirations, but when you're generating work, do you kind of get a little distance, or can you hold those two things concurrently? It's a really different genre. Mm -hmm. I can do it. So yeah. I, could, I could read, like... I don't know, like a nonfiction comic while working on surrealist comic, and it probably wouldn't have any kind of huge impact on it. But, but reading prose, I could do too, maybe. Yeah. Go see an art yeah. installation kind of thing. I can go do that. But otherwise, I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks while I'm working. Okay. So I do, I do end up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Like, when I was, when I had started working on Graveyard Shakes, I wanted to stay away from ghost stories, mm -hmm. just in general. Yeah. But like, that, I was, I was definitely like, I can't, I can't stop reading. It's just like, a habit. Yeah. Um, I'm listening to every day. right yeah, now while yeah. working on <laughs> stuff. So, you know, it's really scary. And yet, but it keeps my butt in the chair. Yeah. That's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, believe it or not, we're almost out of time. I, I wanted to make sure that if anybody had questions for you guys, um, we got to hear them. Can you walk over to the mic? And if, I can, we can probably do two. So if there's anybody else who's got one, just gravitate over toward the mic. If not, you know, we'll just keep talking until it's time for us to leave the room. But go, go ahead. I'm really curious about how each of you um, decides your ending. Is it something you try to figure out in the beginning, or is it a part of your process? Like, how does that fit into the world building and character design? And that Do you want to go first, Ben, because you were talking about story structure a second ago. Um, yeah, I think it's important to, like, at least have a loose idea of the ending, or else you're just kind of going to be flopping around. <laughs> but it, it all depends on the project. Like, if you're working on the story and all of a sudden it requires, like, a different ending, then you should be flexible and, like, adapt to that. Um, How do you know if it requires a different ending? Like, if you had one in mind and... Um, I don't know. It, like, it all depends on the story. Like, if something is like deadline sensitive and you kind of have to just stick to whatever <laughs> <Kill> it. <laughs> <laughs> then like you need to do that but if you have some time for like a personal project um, and you're working on it and like other things change or you realize the story needs to go this way instead of where it was going before um, like a different ending might make more sense or have more emotional effect I don't know I think a lot about emotional beats. Like, that's a big one. For, I'm very feelings-oriented. Um, and I, the a graphic novel that I'm working on right now that is also nautically inclined uh, was going to be autobiographical, and then there was an emotional impact that biographically was what happened to me, but the way that it happened wasn't a good story. Um, and there were elements from things that had happened in the tall ship sailing community that I could pull in and use, and I would need to fictionalize the story, but it would allow me to make the same point, so like the emotion is still true, but the narrative device that gets you there uh, is fictionalized, if that, if that makes sense. So that was what caused me to change tack and say, okay, this is going to be fiction now. And suddenly it opened up all these possibilities. I'm so used to working oh, yeah. from life that it was like, I, uh, it's kind of paralyzing because you could do anything, right? But if you know, uh, like a method actor, right, is making it up, they're, they're faking it on stage, but they're faking it from a place of real emotion that they have experienced. And that's what storytelling is. Like, it's not going to land if you don't know 
how it feels in, in your bones. Laura, does it work differently for you in Craig Shakes and Adorable Empire? Because like one of them is sort of serialized and could change where it's going. The other one was going to be all done at mm -hmm. once. Do you know what I mean? Uh, for, for me, it's um, the, the world building and the story structure don't necessarily, um, they're, they're like separate things. It's the, it's the character building and the story structure that are like intertwined. And so it's, for me, it's more about where does the protagonist begin and where do they end? Um, and emotionally, like, where is that? Um, and with Adorable Empire, I have no idea. I just thought it was a one-off, and then I just... And then you made it number two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. I think that's how Ghost World was made, too. It's like, a, first there was a, a Ghost World story, mm -hmm. and then there was another Ghost World story, and then, like, the third one, he's like, oh, I guess I'm writing a story about these girls. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you can actually watch it if you look at the individual chapters. The next to last chapter is, like, twice as long as all the ones before. <laughs> and then the final chapter is, like, four times as long as all the ones before, because he has to wrap it up. And in Cartesia Tales, we, we like deliberately set out to make it up as we were going along, but we're coming up on the final issue. So we want the stories to have a conclusion, because the series is going to end. And that means that um, we had to sit down at last year's SPX and like really seriously plot uh, how the last issue was going to unfold so that we could have all the things that you want to have in the conclusion of a story and still have it move across the map the way that our book moves across the map and also have each of the individual characters that we care about get to a place of emotional resolution. It was really kind of a crossword puzzle, yeah. but, but a fun one. I mean, I'm actually psyched to get this thing done because I feel like the ending is actually going to work. The thing that I love most about it is that we've been telegraphing one potential ending for this big plot that involves a it's kind of a pollution problem, a world pollution problem, the miasma. And telegraphing one possible way that it's going to work. And since we've been telegraphing that all along, this is like not totally a spoiler, but you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, because, because we know that, it, because we've been setting this up, we know that it, um, we can't deliver that. Because mm. it would be too obvious. Mm -hmm. So like the characters all think this is how it's going to work. But halfway through reading the final issue, you're going to see that it will work that way. And there's a thing that makes it not work that way that is part of what the miasma is that we haven't known yet. And once that's unveiled, we're gonna, it has, the problem has to be solved a different way. And like that reversal, like that's part of the way that stories work. You know, one of the things that I think I've been learning as a teacher of writing and also as a cartoonist and an editor over the last few years is like stuff about just the basic the basic logic of a story and how um, we, like the, the very beginning of a story gives you expectations about how it's gonna end. Mm. The place where it starts predicts what will count as a good resolution, what kinds of things will count as a good resolution, but if you only get the thing that you're expecting at the very beginning, then it's not fun, it's not interesting. So you gotta have like, you gotta satisfy that initial desire but in a way that feels like work, or not work, but an achievement. Unexpected Something happens. Unexpected and inevitable. Yeah, unexpected yeah, and that's inevitable. Phrase. That's nice. But um, uh, like solving it that way was, uh, uh, it was, I mean, it's thrilling that we're getting, I can't wait to see how it turns out. But um, like, <laughs> I've been rewatching Avatar The Last Airbender with my son it's recently, so and it's really good about plot in ways that I don't totally understand how they did it. But that I love the way that they set you up f for most of the series, thinking that the kids are going to beat the Fire Lord during this total eclipse when the firebenders don't have their power. And then when it finally happens, the firebenders are ready for them. And they, they don't do it. They can't, they can't solve the problem in the way that they've been setting up for like a whole season of the show. And then there needs to be a new solution that they figure out in the last few episodes. And I, I don't want to blow it for you. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's really good. But uh, yeah. I, I think if we answer your questions super quick, we have time to do it, and then we've got to get out of the room. So, Okay, um, I'd like to hear some comments on uh, the world building uh, in the graphic novel comic environment where you have pictures and words, um, especially when a lot of the panels perhaps are likely to have no words. Over. Um, I always feel like I've done my job properly if 
you could read the comic without any words attached to it and still get a general gist of the story. The words and story should be interwoven, and they, I mean, it is a symbiotic art form, and yeah. it should complement each other, but you should be able to tell what's going on from the pictures alone if you really had to. Yeah, I mean, at least reading time. French comics, again, I'm exactly. going to harp on about this, but, like, there's an amazing book called Liddy, which is... Um, just a gorgeous story and like I don't read a lick of French and I read this book uh, just pouring over all of the panels because the cartooning was so expressive and the color added so much to the mood of the piece that it was kind of, and it wasn't a super straightforward narrative it's kind of magical realist and there's some interesting stuff going on and I more or less got the whole thing because like the visuals and the acting were so exquisite and I'm sure the dialogue added stuff I'm sure there was you know but that there wasn't a lot of narration mm -hmm. there uh, and the, the rule generally that people point to is show don't tell right if you can have a piece of action that exemplifies or like the, the marketplace example if you can see two characters bartering for something rather than using currency that's better than a box saying in 1764 the currency law abolished the world yeah, you know although it's interesting most of the time people say show don't tell they're talking about prose writing where mm -hmm. it's all telling actually and that is true <laughs> yeah, it's all actually telling but there's a kind of writing that is that is showing like you right. you uh, have characters doing things in the world and then there's another kind of telling that's like expository. Well, Bob shows up and kisses the woman in the room instead of going, Bob met his girlfriend at such a, yeah. you, know, you sort of know yeah, the relationship right, right. from an actor. There's old Batman, Batman comics, right, where the caption is, the Batman scales the building, and then the picture is Batman climbing a building, or like, and yeah, it's like, I mean, okay, we get it. You want to think, think about comics as um, enabling you to have uh, world building come across either in the visuals or in the words, but you don't want the words to be exp exposition for something that could be taken care of by images. Although I, I have to admit, Return of the Dapper Men is designed to sort of be like a, a children's book being read, so there's an there's this very sort of... A um, voice, yes, yeah, like a there's a very there's a, there's a very clear narrative voice that's just sort of like dreamy exposition for yeah. parts of it, and I've never done another book that was like that. Well, I, don't, I don't think that, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a narrative no, in a comic, not, but, but you, you want to like use the narrative yes. to, you want to use the narrator to do things that would be hard for visuals to accomplish. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think there's rules that are in place, and if you're yeah. going to break the rules, you need to know yeah. <laughs> why, yeah. why you're changing things up. You know, if you're, if you're going to do something like that, you do it for a purpose. Right. Not just because... I put easier. diagonal panels in because they're cool. Right. And you're like, no, you put right. them in because this person is running up an escalator and there's a chase scene. <laughs> and you to draw your eye to the yeah. yeah. Like, Becky Cloonan had a great run on um, Conan comics, and there was a whole sequence of panels where Conan's at sea. Conan. Oh, Conan, sorry. Right. Conan sorry, comics not, would, not Conan, the, the late the night talk television. Show host, host. No, he's in a loincloth and he's fighting monsters, isn't that? The, yeah. <laughs> um, watch that. There, but there's a bit where they're at sea on a ship, and the panels are slanting back and forth to replicate the motion of the vessel. And at first I was reading it and I was like, why is she, oh. And it just, it adds so much subconsciously yeah. to the page that it's really, it's very satisfying. Well, we should, um, we actually got to wrap up so that the next panel can start on time, but I want to invite all of you guys in the audience to seek us out at our tables. Uh, Isaac, what's your table number? Uh, I, I, I'm at K8 and Lucy's at K9 and Ben is at, what, H? M3. To M M three wait I'm way off M three I'm at M six M six I can't remember the numbers but, but she's over the top shelf, the top shelf so yeah it's W or something <laughs> anyway you can look this up in the program but come by talk to us take a look at our books and and like also you know if you have further questions that's one of the things we do is talk to people so you know come by come find us thanks guys thank you